In this episode of STEMiverse, Marcus and I talk with John Bufoot. John is a STEM robotics teacher and trainer. He's a science and STEAM specialist in the state of New South Wales in Australia for primary schools. He also facilitates and delivers technology workshops through the Mac ICT Innovation Centre at Macquarie University in Sydney. John is also a founder of Cyrific, a company that delivers specialist science and robotics training for schools. As you'll see, John has a passion for science and technology and a vast experience in teaching it. He also has a lot of experience outside of teaching and in particular in communications, marketing, electronics, avionics and as a special effects technician. This is STEMiverse, episode 8. Welcome to STEMiverse, the podcast that helps educators become awesome at teaching STEM, be it at home or in the classroom. I am Peter Dalmaris, and with my co-host, Marcus Sharpie, our mission is to bring you the experiences of educators, students, and stakeholders who strive every day to make the teaching and learning of science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and art better. So hi, John. I'd like to welcome you to STEMiverse. I'm here with Marcus at the STEMiverse studio, Mm -hmm. (laughs) and we'd like to talk to you about your experience as a STEM robotics uh, teacher and trainer. I know you've got uh, quite a colorful experience uh, going to things like avionics. Uh, I know you're a special effects technician in the past, and uh, I guess that a lot of that spilled into what you do now. So uh, how about you take the next one, two minutes, as much time as you like, to tell us a little bit about your background before you dive into your STEM experiences. Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Marcus. Well, yes, um, I had actually been in, the, uh, in different industries before I started teaching. And one of my passions was to become a pilot in the Air Force. And I, unfortunately, I didn't quite get the, the grades required for the HSC. And so then I fell back on my next subject of interest, which was electronics. And I've always been a bit of an electronics hacker, um, going from even pr- from primary school, I think from the age 10, that I got my first electronics kit. I think it was a, a Radio Shack 150-in-1 kit. I think Marcus and Peter will probably remember that. And it's hard to get electronic kits like that these days. Uh, they look a little bit different. And so I've always been a bit of an electronics enthusiast and... Um, and then I took up a trade in electronics. And so I was in, in commercial consumer goods, fixing cassette plays and radios and, and DVDs. And I only just started to come out then, believe it or not, and, uh, and the TVs. And so so what about was stuff. that? Uh, that was in about um, 84, I started my apprenticeship in electronics. And so after about two years of doing consumer electronics, because I always had a love for flying, I found an opportunity to transfer my apprenticeship into avionics. So I started working for an avionics company at Bankston Airport and called Daisel Avionics. And, and it, my, my path took a very different course. It wasn't so much about the theory of electronics anymore. It was more about um, installing all of the avionic equipment in aircraft. So I found myself flat my back underneath cockpits and pulling out wires and then in putting in new installations and you know completely working from from nose to tail on, on some aircrafts installing um, new intercom systems and and so it certainly brought me closer to aircraft and I found myself in the air a lot testing various um, avionics and then also being taken across the country doing some um, servicing or fault finding on avionics and used to go out with the boss and install lots of navigation systems when the old tracor navigation systems were popular and we do some jobs um, off um, oil rigging stations and install big navigation systems into some of the big Iroquois helicopters that we're taking workers from the mainland at, in Darwin across to Troughton Island. We did lots of work out there. And so I found myself getting a, uh, having the enjoyment of working with electronics but also working in the aviation industry and, um, and going in aircraft as well. And then I tried to get into the Air Force again. Actually, this time was was the Army. And I thought I'd try to get into, um, they had a, a, an intake for Black Hawk helicopter pilots. And I got really close. I got to the selection board day. And I was about, I think I was about 21 when I got that far. 
but I found it quite difficult and having a number on my back and having these officers scrutinizing what you were doing out in the field. And I think I was a little bit too uncomfortable with the whole proceedings and probably a little bit immature and I didn't get selected. And so after that, I decided to fly hang gliders. And so that's how I, I got into hang, hang gliding. And, and then after, I think I was in the avionics industry for about four years. And so I learned a lot of skills in, in electronics as well and the, as well as in installations. And then, and then I found an opportunity because at that time I had a love of uh, movie making and I, for some reason I just, just had this instant fascination with making movies and editing and at about, around about the same time I had an opportunity to go and work for a special effects company for, in films in Sydney and it's very rare to find any special effects company hiring people uh, that wasn't too far from where I lived. And so I went there and he actually wanted somebody who had an electronics experience and so the next thing I, I was doing, I was um, I resigned from my avionics business, and and next thing I was working for a special effects company, doing all sorts of effects for commercials, TVs, uh, TV shows, movies, between electronic effects and atmosphere and explosions and rain and and smoke and even um, cosmetics and uh, makeup effects. Wow. So it was, yeah, quite a broad quite a broad area in, in filmmaking and and so it was just tremendous. I had sudden, suddenly I had the, this responsibility of of not just um, fixing things and, and wiring things but actually designing things. And so I'm not sure if you remember but back in the 90s, I think it was, yeah, I think it was about the early 90s or yeah, around that time, we had Candid Camera Australia. <laughs> and so... Yeah, they, they set up these little gags in people's workplaces and played pranks on them. And they needed this, uh, this unit, this little box that they could plug their television equipment into and, and also make this telephone ring as well and then record the audio coming from the telephone. And so I actually designed that and I, I was pretty happy to, to come up with that on my own. And so I was my boss. And so that was, so I was in the industry there for about two years, but it was very low paying. And so I didn't, it didn't last for me because I needed to earn a bit more money. And so of all things, I went into the, the sales industry. So I ended up spending four years as a financial services consultant. So out of electronics altogether. And it was a sales industry. It, it was an interesting part of my life. But then I, after that, after sales, I, I didn't want to do that anymore. And so I went into communications. And, and so the next 10 years, I was in communications and marketing. And that's, that's actually where I got the skills to, to tackle a university degree and, and improve my writing ability and, and research. And, and so then I applied to become a teacher, uh, applied for uni at the age of about 34, I think it was, and I finally got in and did my four years full-time study at Australian Catholic University. And, and then after that, stint at uni, I graduated as a um, all subjects primary school teacher because I kind of enjoyed working with that age group. And, and for the first three years of working as a primary school teacher, I found it pretty tough because it was about the same time <laughs> that my first child or my only child was, was, uh, was born at that time. And, and so being a, a new dad and a new teacher at a pretty big school, it was very, very challenging both physically and emotionally to cope with everything that's happening in schools. And so after about three years, I decided to specialise because I've always liked science and, and I've, I've liked technology and, and that, that's when I was introduced to Lego Robotics. So it was actually my, my fourth year of uni. I was asked to take part in a robotics pilot to see how effective it was in schools. I think it was back in 2006. And so little did I know that that little stint where I was still at uni and, and assisting other teachers to implement Lego Robotics as a, um, a teaching resource, that was going to have a huge impact on my teaching life and vocation because who would have thought that would have now led me to focusing more in that area. So that's how, uh, that's how I actually got into robotics and how it became more of a specialty after doing about three years full-time. 
I really like the diversity in your background, and I'm sure it comes out as a teacher now. But I just wanted to ask you if, in your experience dealing with a lot of teachers uh, in what you do as a trainer, is that something typical? Do you typically find teachers that have such a diverse background? Right. Yeah. Well, no, it's it's not common for that. Most of my um, uni colleagues were almost half my age. And it was rare, possibly about 10%, if not less, were slightly mature age compared to them. And, and those who were um, a little bit older, a lot of them were, were mums who didn't have a lot of different occupations and vocations. So um, I guess I was unique that I was a male in the primary school area or primary education area plus having a bit of diversity. So it was, it was unique, not common, and it was really helpful in my teaching because almost any subject I could teach, I could draw upon experiences from a variety of those industries. It was tremendous experience. So the diversity in your background also gave you diversity in the kind of subjects that you could tackle and teach. Can you see a connection there? Yeah, definitely. Like what, one of the areas that I taught when I was in in the teaching year six was electronics, and what we did is is I I linked the electronics topic to aviation because I liked aviation pretty much since since starting uni, everything that I needed to do I linked to an area of interest, which is what I think teachers could do with their students if they give them an assignment, give them the option then to link the assignment content to an area of interest, and they can answer it that way. And that's what I did with my teaching programs. I always linked it to an area of interest. So there I was teaching electronics within the context of aviation. And then the, the excursion that I organized was at my old avionics company <laughs> at Bankston Airport. And so they were tickled pink. They felt like it was their way of give, giving back to the community. So they shut down their entire um, avionics um, center there and allowed us to go in and spend a whole day in their service center, in the, in the hangar, and doing talks inside their boardroom. So it was one of my most proudest excursions I ever organized. Awesome. And so um, it probably cost the company a few grand of, uh, of lost work because they gave up the day to have us come to their center. They, um, that was part of their way of giving back to the community. So there were lots of examples like that where I linked it back to something that I enjoyed and I linked it to you know, my experience at work and and uh, even in the special effects industry, there are links there as well. So it was extremely valuable, I would say. When you were doing communications, what were you doing that back then? Like, was that uh, advertising or? No, I was working for a um, financial services company. It was Westpac Financial Services. Mm-hmm. And uh, I started there in the customer service section after I finished in sales. Mm-hmm. And and then I went from customer service to marketing, where I had a hand in uh, helping the, the communications manager get newsletters out to customers and helping them, my manager write letters to customers and liaising with product managers, whether it's life insurance or investments. And then after I – and that's where I really cut my teeth in, in just the communications and, and, and marketing and knowing how to proofread and how to put content together and copy and working with, with mail houses. And after a few years there, I applied for another position at another financial services company where they wanted a communications manager. So, and so moving to that industry and moving to that role, I should say, it, um, the onus was on me to, to write the content, come up with the working with the, the designers and come up, come up with a new newsletter and write content to our, you know, the customers. So there's nothing like being thrown in the deep end to learn, learn a lot of skills very quickly. And so that's what I, that's what I found myself doing. In fact, I think it's, a, it's healthy to have a little bit of a little bit of fear around whether you can whether you can do a, a, a job or not because <laughs> without a little bit of fear you probably won't work as hard you know if you do a bit too confident you might actually be a little bit too lackadaisical and take it for granted and won't put in as much effort but if you're you've got a little bit of fire under your under your bum then uh, you know i think it's more likely you'll come up with something better awesome. i think it's, it's like 
it, it's good to stress yourself. That's how you know that you're actually growing, right? It, it's not supposed to be just nice and comfortable like a walk at the beach. Learning can be hard and can cause stress, but you got to do it. Ah, oh, yes. As a, as a matter of fact, I oh, my I think it was my second year, no, first year of uni. And I discovered for the first time referencing. <laughs> All right. Yeah. <laughs> I thought, what the hell is this? I couldn't believe it. It was like, this is so difficult. Are we expected to reference everything we, <laughs> we uh, refer to in, some, in, 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 in our research? And I had not experienced that before, you know, in so many years at school and, and in, in the workplace. And, and anyhow, and so one of the first things we were given to do in, at uni was we had to write an essay. And so well, they wanted to see where all the students were at. Now, back, back then when I started uni, which wasn't that long ago really, I think the UAI to become a primary school teacher was about, oh, it was probably about 75 80%. So it was a decent mark you needed to to get to get into primary education, and so you had a lot of a lot of school leavers uh, that was in the previous year. So a lot of students age eighteen, maybe nineteen, as their first year student at uni, all come out of doing lots of assignments, lots of essays, and yet this was my very first formal essay where I was about to be marked. Since I did my HSC, that would have been what about nearly nearly twenty years. Maybe 18 years prior, I hadn't been marked on any written work, and I failed. I failed the, the uh, English subject at HSC. It was my lowest subject out of all the subjects in HSC, and I bombed out big time. It was it was one of my worst subjects all the way through school, and so uh, I I couldn't really write an essay to save my life. And so I just done all this work in the communication industry, and done a lot of hard work and being pushed and dragged, kicking, screaming for my old bosses. And so I, I felt like I was a better writer now, but I had never been put to the test from a formal you know, lecturer or someone who's about to mark my written work. So there are about 100 or so uni students writing this essay and were given a choice of what, what to write about. And, and I rather enjoyed the process. I got right into it. I wrote it like I was writing an article for one of the, the newsletters for, of in, within the financial services industry. I just wrote it like it was a work, work job. And over the next few weeks, we were called in one at a time to, uh, to, you know, to see the lecturer and to discuss, you know, areas of strengths, areas of weaknesses, what we can work on, et cetera. And so my name got called up and I went in to see the lecturer and she asked me for my name and I told her and she said, oh, right, um, you're John Burford. And I said, yeah. I said, why? She goes, well, you've got the highest mark. <laughs> oh, good work. <laughs> and I've gone, wow, I almost, almost, um, I'm pretty sure I teared up or at least got a little bit, you know, swelled up, swelled up in the eyes. And I could not believe it. You know, all these people that used to always get good marks in English and I used to always fail. And so it just showed being in the workforce, getting the, the workplace skills of writing or anything that you need in workplace skills, as a mature person, as an adult, you're, you are more likely to pick up those skills. So it doesn't mean that you, if you fail a subject at school, it doesn't mean that you're going to always be no good at it. And so uh, I suddenly realized that, you know, I had the ability to, ability to write and, and it certainly got me through uni and I did quite well at uni and put a lot of effort. That's the other thing too. I think that the advantage of being a mature age student is that you're doing the, the subjects not because it's just a means to an end, but because you actually enjoy each subject and you get a lot out of it. And so you actually... It was your choice. Yeah, it, it's, it's your choice and, and you see meaning behind the subjects. And I, I, I used to get myself right behind them and as best I could, I'd always link it to some, some area of interest. So I would be motiv- motivated to, you know, to d- dig up the readings and get it done. But uni was essentially a, an initiation process. You can never get through all the readings. And that's, what I think, essentially what achieving a degree is, 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 is half of the quali- part of the qualification is showing that you've mastered something that's very stressful, that you don't have a lot of, you don't have enough time to complete, but you do it as best you can. And that's kind of a bit of a metaphor in life, really. You're never given quite enough time to do things. Well, that's one of the great lessons of attending university. It's, it's an environment where you have to pressure yourself. It's the schedules, mm-hmm. it's the volume of subjects you've got to do. 
see environment like teachers or lecturers you don't like or people that you have to work with and still get the job done and uh, I think stressing yourself is a, is a lot of um, it is a big part of being at university uh, but I just wanted to point out that the way that you described your experience in English writing in English from being I suppose at the bottom of the class at school and then top of the class in university and what happened in the middle in between was your experience on the job actually writing in the industry so learning by doing I suppose that's that was the key for you in just bringing what was very hard for you into something that not that it comes naturally but something that you're now very good at. Yes, you're right. It, it's um, it, and as you said, it, it wasn't easy. Uh, you go through a lot of pain. There's, I don't can't think of any example where you can make significant change without pain. It's uh, it almost comes hand in hand. And and there were times that I hated my boss because he was so so critical of me. And but I'd be spending you know my journeys on the train just trying to rewrite things better and, and I remember writing articles and I, I'd find a, a section in my article that I wouldn't be completely happy with but I couldn't quite work out how to say it and sure enough as soon as I showed my boss he'd, the first thing he'd see is that little like, that paragraph and he'd just smash me with it <laughs> and you know and I, I realised then that, that um, as you get better at writing you can pick up things a lot quicker too and one of the bosses I worked for when I did go to a school, and she was um, she was she was a known uh, she was a very very tough very tough principal, and she um, was difficult to please, and so you had to be uh, on your game the entire time to get credit from her. And one of the first things she said when I wrote something for her, she turned around and said, "Oh, you you, you write well." And it was very hard to get any compliment <laughs> from her, and so you know, it just getting that that reassurance and getting reminded about that, it just shows the you know, the, the the length or the extent that I had changed in terms of my writing ability, but it didn't come without pain, and that's exactly. unfortunate. My son is is a lazy and reluctant reader slash writer, and unfortunately. He's, at, he's 10 now. Unfortunately, he's going to learn the hard way. Yes. And he may be just like me. He may go through the entire school and fail English. And he has to realize at one point he has to go through a lot of pain before he can change. <laughs> I really, I don't think there's any easy way. They have to go through those motions just like you did. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Yeah. I have to remember that. <laughs> so, would you like to switch to the present now? So we spent a bit of time talking about your past and what brought you here. Mm -hmm. But let's uh, have a look at what you do now, which is uh, specifically STEM robotics. I think that's the biggest part of your life right now, isn't it? Professionally, at least. Yeah. So, so I found my way at Macquarie ICT Center uh, because I had done a lot of work around Lego robotics. And how that started was I began teaching part-time at a, another school where the principal allowed me to develop programs, not just uh, with set classes, but gifted and talented programs around robotics. And Lego Robotics was, was very new about 10 years ago in the schools. And, and I was one of the few people that had some experience with it. And I, I actually contacted one of the suppliers who was running a, a workshop on it. So I wanted to attend that workshop to upskill myself. And then they, they wrote back and said, oh, I'm sorry, but the um, facilitator has resigned and we don't have a facilitator, so we have to cancel the workshop. But from that conversation, they said, would you like to work for us as well? <laughs> so, um, so I found myself getting skilled and, and upskilled very quickly, and so I was doing some training for them for any schools that bought the equipment. Who was that? And so I... That was more educational. More educational, okay. And it was Lego Robotics, right? Yeah, more educational. That you're playing with. Yes, that's what they more educational sold just Lego, and they were one of the first suppliers of um, you know, Lego at, at the time. It was the NXT had just come out, and I don't think even Lego We Do was out then at that time. Uh, John, for the benefit of our listeners, could you tell us a little bit about Lego NXT? Uh, for somebody who has never heard of this technology before? 
Okay, so Lego brought out its first robotic educational robotics platform with the RCX. That was around about, I think, 2000 and maybe four, 2005 in Australia. And that was one of the first of its kind, a programmable brick that you can use uh, Lego pieces, but it had a uh, Lego motion sensor. Well, actually, did it have that? No, maybe it had a, a color sensor or light sensor. And it had some motors and it had a brick that you can program. Um, it was like a, a, a click or drag and drop system. It was a little bit difficult to program. You had to wire all the blocks together. And then after a few years so, of the sorry, RCX, you, sorry. It was a program, a graphical programming language that people would use on their computer and then send the instructions to the brick and the brick then will behave accordingly. So it was not, it's a programming language for young programmers, I suppose. Or. Yeah. Yeah, there was, it was, um, most of it was picture blocks and they would transmit the data through, um, I think it was through an infrared tower. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so they had a tower connected to their, their laptop and, and and then they had an infrared receiver on the actual brick and so it would um, re- it would uh, download the you know the program that way and occasionally the firm new firmware had to had to be updated so it would take several minutes for that and so and some high schools were using it as well but I think they they programmed with robot C at the time too and then the NXT came out and that NXT stood for the the next thing which was um, a similar looking brick but it had more power and you could download it through the USB cable. And also it had Bluetooth as well. You could, you could um, link it to another brick uh, using Bluetooth or you could link it to your own computer through Bluetooth. And so you had a little bit more functionality with the NXT system. And um, that was around for several years. And I think it was around about 2013 when the... Uh, EV3 uh, came came out, and the EV3 is the third evolution of of its of its kind, hence why it's called EV3. And that again was another big step up with its power and, and its um, memory capabilities. And both the NXT and the EV3 had a lot more data logging opportunities, particularly the EV3 now, which is an area that I think in schools don't really use and don't. Um, don't really take advantage of that that area of data logging, which is a really exciting area of robotics. So why is data logging exciting? Well, you can you can go out in the field and and take data using the various sensors that you have in the kit, and then you can you know, upload that that data onto the screen and and see it present presented as a graph. And so it's got lots of it's lots of benefits in schools because you know you can you have students predict what the, the, the data might look like and then once the data is, is up online, then you can even analyse the data and, and look back and see where, where this data, what, what this data reflected and, and why. And then you can, you can compare data with um, other scenarios. Some people really get into it. You know, other people find it a bit hard. So great for science, I suppose. Like science is a lot about collecting data and then analyzing it, like going past the robotics part of what EV3 is. Right. So can you connect, for example, temperature, humidity sensors, sensors of that kind to your EV3 block and then record the data of it and then do science with it? Yeah, yeah you could do lots of um, those experiments. I think there are, I think Lego also do... I think science um, have these science packages where you, you can conduct these science experiments, and a lot of it's to do with with data. And I think there are these modules that you can buy in addition to the EV3 system that can support you with those experiments. And I think um, one of those would include a a uh, temperature sensor. I know that I've actually just done some basic temperature gathering of of, um, of data when it comes to you know, seeing how effective insulation is or eskies are when you're you know, measuring the temperature of, the, of a cold can of drink, you know. And it's probably not so much about robotics, but it is about science and data collection and following, following the scientific method, so forth. Yeah. And so um, getting towards, I think, what you're asking about STEM. So 
having that experience with Lego Robotics got me into the, the role at Macquarie Uni ICT Centre where they were working with students and teachers in de- developing and their capacity to be um, to integrate um, ITC in, into the classroom. And robotics initially was a big part of that. But then it, it started to become a lot broader than just robotics. You know, there was also game design and you know, there was also um, looking at augmented reality and and then we had um, the maker movement started coming in as well. And so and then there was work around uh, developing workshops for, of storytelling and mathematics using ICT. And so the roles of the Macquarie ICT innovation uh, facilitator became quite varied. It wasn't just robotics. And so, and it was around about that time, then STEM became, became a bit of a buzzword in the industry and became a very popular uh, concept in primary school, although it's been in high school for a number of years. It so just started to knock on the primary school doors and suddenly all, all the schools, want, a lot of the schools wanted to know what is this STEM all about. And so we found that conveniently robotics fitted nicely in STEM. But I think, I think a lot of people jumped on the bandwagon and started calling everything STEM. Yeah, okay. What, what's uh, what's <clears throat> STEM um, in the way that you approach it and as a trainer uh, uh, explain it to teachers that are getting in it now? Well, you know, I, I attended a workshop just recently on STEM and because STEM was such a new thing and it was hard to find any, any teachers who had any skills in STEM and, and even rarer to find any, any facilitators who can teach them. And so I attended one of these workshops and I was a bit disappointed that it, it was the definition of STEM was still a bit vague. And I think the definition of STEM is evolving personally. I, I think that the role of a teacher in science, technology, engineering, and maths, and if you incorporate the maybe the more modern term of STEAM, which includes the arts, not just creative arts, but also maybe the humanities as well. Uh, there's a, a, a growing contingent of educators who feel that if anything is worth making, it has to be equitable and, and fair and just. So that's why they feel you know, it's better to refer to it as STEAM rather than STEM. But you've got different schools of thought around that. Some people just would prefer it called STEM and others accept the STEAM uh, acronym. So for educators... I think the a STEM or STEAM facilitator has very various um, scenarios or definitions. It could be a classroom teacher who's asked to integrate some of their units of work and so that they're covering more than just one or two key learning areas or subject areas. But it could also be a specialist like myself who goes in there one day a week and looks at what the, um, the classroom teacher is doing, say around science or history, and develops a, uh, a unit of work based on, say, an hour a week, an hour, uh, an hour each week with a class where they're actually making something. So I think the definition of, of a STEM teacher fundamentally has to be they make something useful and ideally link it back to uh, what is the... Um, the science or history component of that term so that it it's, uh, enhances what they're learning in class. It's not just a standalone subject that has no connection to what they're doing in class. It ideally would be something that they link back in their class. So on the same topic, I, I wonder in your experience as you see it uh, in schools, is STEM about a particular methodology or about a particular selection of so-called subjects or learning by doing or perhaps all of that together? What have you seen in schools? Yeah, I think there's some work that needs to be done there. It's it's still a bit ambiguous how schools and principals take that role on and how they see that. Uh, I think I personally feel that, that for, for one thing, they have to make something, whether it's a physical thing that they're making through use of um, – tools and technology, or they're making a digital uh, video or the digital animation. Um, they have to create something. And so, and so the, 
the content to subject areas need to relate back to what they're doing in class time. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's very easy for teachers to, to rebadge a design and make task from a science and tech unit as a STEM unit. And I think uh, a lot of the um, design and make units of work from science and tech subjects have been rebadged as STEM. And is that so, okay? Yeah, I was going to just ask myself that. I mean, is that okay? Is it okay to rebadge design and make tasks? Well, it it probably a lot of the subjects probably are okay, but I think you know I think perhaps a lot of the design and make tasks weren't that weren't always that good. Mm-hmm. So having a STEM facilitator, you have a a chance that at um, like you have a a second bite at, at the apple or the cherry or whatever the phrase is. You have a, se- a second go at it. So whatever they whatever they're doing in science should not necessarily be replaced by the STEM teacher. The STEM teacher ideally would be enhancing it. So they would work off what they're doing in in the science lessons, and then add on another, you know, creating task. Yeah. So what does the STEM facilitator bring that the teacher doesn't have? Yes, Say a science teacher. Well, teacher. Yeah. Well. I guess um, I guess the classroom teacher only has they're, they're responsible for teaching all the subjects, and so um, without coming up with an integrated unit of work, if they're just working on teaching all subjects, they just may not have enough time in the week to devote a, a design and make task uh, around using technology, whether it's creating a physical item. And, and it may even overlap in other outcomes that don't fit under science and tech. So that's the other advantage too is with a, a STEM specialist is that they can bring in other outcomes that, that fit nicely into whatever they're creating. And so um, some of it will overlap with science and some of it might be in other areas. And so some schools rather like if they can afford it, if they can afford to put another staff member on the books, then – you know, the classroom teachers can focus on what they need to do with all subjects, you know, while the STEM teacher, um, you know, can really you know, unpack what the skills are, what the, te- what the technology is that they're going to learn to actually go and make something. Now, now there, there's the other funding issue for schools is will schools employ a STEM specialist as a, an RFF teacher? In other words, it, it gives the classroom teacher a release from face to face, so they go off and do their admin, while while the, um, that hour is given to the STEM teacher to develop a, a unit of work. Or does the school have enough uh, funds to to um, have that teacher sit in with the STEM teacher, so they can uh, co-teach and learn some of the skills that the STEM teacher is bringing, so they can have the skills to carry. Um, maybe that work on with the school if the STEM teacher left. So it's um, a lot of it to do with the, the budget and the funding for schools, whether it becomes just a classroom teacher job where they have to integrate units of work together or it becomes an RFF position for a STEM teacher to come in and, and relieve that, that classroom teacher for an hour while they kind of focus a bit more on you know, the, the, uh, the, the tools and the making of things. Or do they have the funding to co-teach with the classroom teacher? So there's different different levels and different ways that STEM teacher can uh, can be utilised. What does an ideal STEM teacher look like? Just to qualify that, imagine that you have unlimited powers. Perhaps you are the <laughs> minister of education, right? And you've got a total all the control, money, total control, <laughs> and you say, "I'm going to." I'm going to make it so that every single school in Australia has got a dedicated STEM teacher. How would you empower that teacher to do STEM? Well, let's have a look. Um, no pressure. If you had a very well-resourced um, facility like that, I think um, how it, it would look, well, for a start, you would have um, a, a room where you have access to a whole range of of tools and technology, you know, whether it's hand tools to electronic testing equipment to um, different forms of educational robotic robotics, but also a lot of electronic components. And so there's so a makerspace. 
Makerspace to developing, well, Makerspace can be very portable too. So it's like a classroom that has um, very portable uh, components. Like I have a, a trolley, for example, that has a lot of electronic components in all the different tubs. And then you've got another trolley that has all of the um, robotics equipment in different tubs. And so, uh, and then you've got a storeroom that's filled with recycled materials, whether it's tube, cardboard tubes to cardboard boxes, shoe boxes. And so you would have a, a STEM room should have a collection of uh, a collection of recycled materials, and ideally things like tubes, boxes, and uh, and and then you'd have the electronic components, and then you have uh, some robotics equipment, and so you can convert your space to being either robotic session, or and an ideally well equipped uh, school um, room that has not just um, iPads or tablets, but you, for some things you need to have laptops. And so ideally, you know, we found, find ourselves sometimes caught without having the right, um, you know, technology for the students. It's uh, some, some software can only, be, can, only work very, can only work well on a laptop and some on an iPad, so you would have both. A lot of students, particularly the younger age, ages, don't have a lot of experience operating a mouse or even <laughs> copying and pasting just files from screen. one location to another. So that, that will be the technology. Um, what about the methodology of the teacher? Um, like how would um, it's like a 45-minute session of a STEM teacher look like with 10 or 15 students in the class? Yeah. Well, like for example, um, I did a, a lesson last week with year one and we're looking at light. Now the outcomes are for a year one student on light is – you know, is looking at uh, things such as light travels in straight lines, light is heat, uh, that kind of thing. And what we're developing in STEM is they'll be making a solar oven. And so, you know, we, we did a couple of experiments and we had about an hour. I think 45 minutes is probably too short. I, ideally, I think you need about an hour to be effective with STEM. And so a lot of it is is inquiry-based. I think that's important to be inquiry-based with with the teaching and you are you know, directing children to ask the, you know, we, you're trying to direct them to ask the, the questions themselves and if they can't ask the questions then they need to, you know, they need to begin to, um, you guide them, you guide them by asking them key questions rather than telling, telling them the answers about things. And so we had uh, a little mini experiment set up where we had uh, a chocolate Easter egg and we cut it up so that you can put the flat side down on the surface. So we had a black piece of paper, and then we had a white piece of paper, and then we had a silver silver piece of foil, and then we had another piece um, inside a, a tin with the plastic over the top. And so we're we're looking at we're trying to get them to consider, you know, if they're out in the sun the same amount of time, what are we observing? You know, and what are you feeling? What can you see from your senses? And so really getting them to think, you know, from an inquiry perspective, getting them to become like mini scientists and mini engineers and trying to ask those questions why. And so I think in order to get the learning, a STEM teacher needs to, needs, needs to get the kids to, be, to experience it through, through emotions. It needs to be an, an emotional experience before they can actually get that learning to sink in. And how do you do that? Hmm. How do you create the emotion? Well, yeah, I mean, it, it needs to... Is that where fun comes in? It needs to connect with them. You know, it needs to really connect with them. And a lot of it's just storytelling as well, really getting, like, facilitated, getting excited and drawing on stories. And and a lot of children love to hear stories, and sometimes a facil- good facilitator can embellish those stories a bit <laughs> for uh, dramatic inf- impact. And and they they love, especially the the younger ch- children they they love hearing it and but if they can feel see and feel and sometimes smell what's going on around them and that they start to build in this picture anyhow um, experience and so and and once they and the other good thing is it started to build their their vocabulary around what I'm leading them towards so I want them to get an idea on okay, dark colors absorb light. I want them to get an idea that brighter colors reflect light. I want them to get an idea that there's something that happens when you cover it with plastic. And so 
they're still got the, the building some idea of what's going on and they've got some uncertainties and and then we go in and we start looking at how we might be able to build a solar oven and then we look at a couple of images of solar ovens then we make connections with what we've just done in outside with our experiments to what we're seeing made and what the importance of that is and then we start talking about well what can they bring from home that can you know where they can start making that and and, and they get pretty excited. They think, oh, wow, can we make more than one? And so, you know, of course, they say, well, if you, you know, work really hard. And, and so when they're very young, often, often they work together on things in pairs. And so um, that gives them both a chance to collaborate and bounce ideas off each other. And the other thing, too, from a methodology uh, point of view, with STEM, I believe we need, facilitators need to encourage children to solve problems themselves or, you know, all amongst each other. And that's what I do with my robotics workshops because I find half of the benefit of the robotics workshops is not so much learning the content, but it's actually empowering them to, to solve problems and be creative. And so one of my catchphrases in my workshops is C3 before me. And I find that so, so useful because it really puts it back on them to think about the, the issue themselves before they come and see me because it's so easy for them to put their hand up. So could you say that one again? C- it's called C3 before me, which means see three other students before they see an adult. Ah, oh, yes. okay. C3 before me, is, that's, what, what, that's what would be my standard line. If, if any student comes to see me about anything, like whether it is like where does this plug go into or where do I find the off switch, I'll just say C3 before me. And they pretty quickly, all the students realise they, they just can't put their hand up and then get a really, really cop-out answer. I'm putting that on my door at work. Yes, <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> Yeah, they, they have to think about it. And, and then the next, the next bit is, is, is not so much asking somebody just willy-nilly, but coming up with what question to ask. So a good facilitator needs to encourage students to learn through inquiry, then encourage students to um, solve minor questions amongst themselves and with others, and they have this sense of, of, you know, they have efficacy, the self-efficacy of being able to do the research and get it done. That's amazing. I think uh, what you just described in the last few minutes for me covers this, the essence of what STEM is really about, especially when you compare with other traditional subjects. So what you said about STEM is like training children to think and act like scientists and engineers. And in that is... Uh, the importance of asking the right questions uh, and also to collaborate with others. So ask three before you see me. That's that's what scientists do, right? Um, I think that's what the essence is, don't you think, uh, compared to other traditional subjects where it's more about learning things in a more stale way where it's not hands-on, you're not experiencing you know, the joy of solving a problem yourself and combining knowledge comes from those different disciplines. Is that the essence of STEM? Yeah, I, I believe it is. And, and definitely there's a, it's a bigger component in the engineering side too. I think, you know, to answer one of your questions before, how is it different to design and make tasks with um, science and tech units? There's probably probably a, a larger focus on engineering and mathematics, you know. So uh, that's important, you know. So I think um, the risk of just rebadging design and make tasks is that you lose a lot of the engineering and mathematics side to STEM. And so you know, every every now and again, when you're developing a STEM unit, it's it's worth considering, you know, how can we make this an engineering task and a math task. You can't always do it. You know, sometimes creating STEM units, when you're working with schools, you've only got a history uh, content to leverage from. And so it, it makes it very difficult to, um, sometimes it can only be um, like, like a, a, a scratch junior program where they're developing a, a, a story about r- uh, rights and roles in, in the classroom. And so there's not a lot, of, a lot of engineering in that, so you know, so to speak. So, you know, uh, so some some STEM units are a little bit more challenging to to develop from within a class content area than others because typically schools 
they alternate every term. You know, it might be a science focus, and the next term it might be history focus, and they can sometimes alternate that way. So, whereas the STEM teachers is employed usually for the whole year. Um, so, and I think I think how a STEM teacher is defined and what is a, a great STEM teacher, I think that's still evolving as schools are getting used to how to employ STEM teachers and how best to engage their current staff with a STEM teacher or, you know, retrain existing staff into that role. I, th- I think it's there's change happening around STEM facilitators. So, you know, in 12 months' time, it could be quite different. Great. Thanks for that, John. So looking at the time, we are now ready to get into a few rapid question <laughs> and answers. <laughs> so that means that we are going to try and keep our questions very short. You can take your time, of course, to answer them. So, uh, but they're very specific things. So let's start with the first one. Uh, is there a person, uh, whether you know them personally or somebody's somebody who wrote a book that you read and uh, and uh, shaped the way that you teach. So is there a person that has been mostly influential in the way that you teach? Hmm, the way that I teach. Well, I used to, I still am a big believer in, in human development and um, positive psychology. And one of the, the people that's been very influential for me as a person has been this gentleman, his name is Skip Ross. And he wrote this book called Say Yes to Your Potential. And from time to time, I listened to a lot of his words and, and in, in doing Lego robotics workshops or even just in, in, in most subjects in general, you can always tap into this, um, this field of, of human endeavor and, and psychology. And uh, because if you can touch if you can reach somebody and, and they for, for a brief moment they see you and you see them as being one student in the class and, and they recognize you and, and they see that you take notice of them, it means the world, world to them. And when you've got class sizes between 20 and 30 odd in a class, and it's easy for people to get missed. And so having a belief in, in psychology and, and um, human achievement and human development uh, they have been the most influential people in my life, uh, whether it's people like Skip Ross or whether it's um, uh, Martin Seligman from Positive Psychology. And, you know, there's a, uh, Stephen Covey from Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. You know, all of those people have been inf- influential to me. What advice would you give new educators who are getting prepared to start teaching STEM? So yeah, new educators start teaching STEM. I think um, they need to get a, a, a basic handle on electronic theory. I think it'd be useful for them to to understand electronics. How would they do that? Well, yeah, it's good good point because um, it seems to be uh, seems to be difficult just to get um, some basic theory. I don't know. I don't know. I'm I'm very lucky that I've actually got a trade in electronics. Not many teachers have a trade in electronics. Ele- electronics is Having a, an understanding of electronics is like you've got superpowers. You know, uh, <laughs> it's not um, something you can easily get. It's it's like Such somebody basic who can, electronics new to me. Yeah, well, it, it's like someone who can speak another language. It's not something you can just uh, overnight just get get done. It takes years sometimes. So I don't know. I don't. I don't know how they can get prepared for that. Is there a book um, you'd recommend? No, I, I, I would probably start looking at. Um, just looking at an, uh, an electronics kit, maybe, you know, one of those yeah. twenty in one or fifty in one, yeah. and and start looking at some of the resources that children might start looking at as a way as a starting point. I know they have, um, I know Little Bits, um, the technology that Little Bits have brought brought to schools, are great for allowing children to be to quickly prototype in creative ways using electronic components. So one of Little Bits. Uh, little bits, you know, the, the little bits components has, has, has been great for, for students to quickly prototype creative solutions well, using. What are little bits? What are little bits? Well, little bits, uh, little, little modules that, um, that electronic modules that, that click together and they use magnetic technology so that the, how they are, how they do click together is, uh, is in the right polarity. So it's a very clever system. 
and they've been out for a few years now. And you can get almost anything on on a little bit module these days. And uh, a lot of STEM classes have little bits, and I think there are other products out there that that are similar to little bits as well. And and there are snap circuits. So, John, you, would you say that just in the question of how a young STEM teacher or older STEM teacher can train in electronics? I suppose the answer is just train like a child, right? Um, look at what kids today do to learn electronics. There's little bits, as you said, there's Arduino kits that are specifically mm-hmm. designed for young kids. There's M-boards. So just pick one of those resources and uh, self-learn, which is one of the yeah. cornerstones, I suppose, of education, the ability to learn yourself. Um, yeah, I, I, I got part of that question. I, I think you were saying um, about... Uh, to get the training, then sometimes it's, it's good just to follow the same path that students will follow. Exactly. Uh, yeah, whether it's um, like snap circuits or even through, um, you know, creating paper circuits. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. And maybe maybe teachers can also get some PD. I think there's some work around developing teachers' um, skills around electronics, and that seems to be a good base. Because after that, there's just ways of um, linking, you know, ITC into the curriculum and having a good handle on, you know, social media and digital technologies and and what apps to use on iPads and and programming and getting familiar with, you know, how to code using graphical blocks um, and then leading towards if you're high school trained and looking at more alphanumeric programming. So. I think if you, if you looked at, at STEM and looked at the skill areas, I think there are about three or four. There's electronics and then there's coding and, and then there's um, some robotics and then the other field might be um, movie making or augmented reality or, um, you know, that kind of thing. So um, I think, like, they're the different pillars of STEM. Uh, and then from that... Like if I th- if I link, think back to the STEM units that we've I've done the last few years, it's been like for example making a periscope uh, to um, enhance um, a unit on light, where they get to they get to make a practical thing that uses the ideas of reflection um, in creating a periscope. Another idea is the solar oven. Another idea is the making a marble run or a marble maze where they look at um, cause and effect and and inertia and and, and angles too, and and gravity, and um, and then also developing a, a scratch game on on uh, supporting the your knowledge on on Australia, and making a game where they can answer questions around native animals or flora and fauna, uh, to um, having a family album that's linked to an Erasmus app, so that uh, they can bring their their photos to life. Um, by scanning, you know, the pages and, you know, through Erasmus, to bring video and, and pictures. Uh, and trying to think of other ones that we've done in the past. But you can see from that. That's good examples. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, based on that and still on the topic of uh, professional development, uh, do you have any professional development uh, could be seminars, it could be workshops uh, or conferences around Australia that you would recommend that STEM teachers uh, attend or follow? Uh, well, the, the STEM conferences, um, they've only just started to, to happen. Uh, and previous to this, particularly STEM conferences, you know, there were, um, there was future learning conferences and uh, you know, there was just recently a STEM conference in the Novotel. Uh, Is that a regular the, conference that happens at yeah, a particular well, place? Yeah, it might be regular. I mean, it probably only just started in the last couple of years. Okay, we'll look it up. So it's but, called STEM, a STEM conference, is it? Yeah, I think there was, um, I think it was just called a STEM, yeah, I think it was, STEM, oh, what was it called? Um, it was a STEM conference that was, I think it was last month at the Novotel. And it probably it may have had another name, but you know the word STEM was you know um, very prominent. much mm. prominent. Yeah, yeah. So it was that? Uh, yeah, and you know I think the uh, New South Wales um, 
The, Do you take? Uh, you know, I'm trying to think of the. Oh gosh, <laughs> I should have written this one down. Um, the Science Teachers Association of mm-hmm. New South Wales yeah. stands well. You know, they sometimes um, release workshops where they invite people to to talk about science and techie stuff. So I'd, I'd check out the Stan website, Science, mm-hmm. and Te- yeah. Science Teachers Association, New South Wales, and then the um, Australian Science Teachers Association as well uh, is another one to look at. Um, one of the one of the the great opportunities I was given from them was uh, to be one of the the only primary school teachers selected in New South Wales to travel to Japan, mm-hmm. and yeah, and that was a, a few years ago. And that was awesome to spend a week in Japan. And we were teaching science and tech to um, Japanese students. And, and we sat in on a few of their set lessons as well. Believe it or not, they are not as, as well equipped in their schools as we are. We are far more equipped with technology than, than most of the Japanese schools. You wouldn't think so. You would think it would be a lot the other way around. And they have some, some certainly have some flagship schools where there's lots of technology in there, but it's it's, it's actually fewer than what they have here in, in our schools. So, uh, and that was through the Australian Science Teachers Association. Have you had experiences from other uh, countries as well in a way that you would give, would give you um, an understanding of Australia versus uh, the world and how we are doing in STEM teaching? I think Boston is like the mecca of not just robotics, but I think it could be even STEM. So uh, I, th- I think you've got Tufts University there and you've got um, MIT in Boston. You know, I think that would be, I think if people wanted to really you know, look at, you know, where can they go overseas, you can even do a placement for six months um, at Tufts University and, and be part of an outreach program where you're actually putting a lot of these skills into practice. Uh, they are tremendous, and and they do work a lot, a lot of work with Lego Education as well. But I think with their association with MIT and the fact that there's so many innovative companies coming out of Boston, you know, that would be like, you know, that is, you know, like, uh, you know, the, the road to glory is is if you wanted to spend time in that area. Right. Um, That's the epicenter. Great teaching. It is. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Do we have any equivalent in Australia? Of that, well, geez, do we? Um, hmm. Uh, do we have any equivalent? I mean, I'd like to say that the Mac ICT was pretty good. <laughs> you know, they, they um, try to do a lot in that area. Uh, the, the Futures Learning Centre is will get there as well, I think, at, at the at Technology Park in Redfern. Uh, so we are I think starting. think University of Queensland is doing some, some good things out of Brisbane there. And and I know that Damien Key is doing a lot of work from that area. He seems to be one of the prominent um, educators in that field. And and also Rob Turok in, in Tasmania, some really good educate, educators in that field of robotics and STEM uh, in, in, in that, in that a- a part of Australia too. Uh, other than that, do we have another centre like Tufts University? I don't think so. I think... There's nothing comes close to what can come out of Boston. So something to aim for. Yeah, something to aim for. If you've got the time, you've got the money, and, and there are opportunities there, and, and uh, it, it might be just you know, contacting a few key people and, and seeing what you can be part of. Great. Awesome. Thank you, John. Yeah. So um, uh, just uh, we just hit the one hour mark, so uh, there's, there's, we had a lot more questions to ask you, in particular about EV3, so we may need to have you back Definitely. for the last <laughs> But for now, um, if our listeners would like to get in touch with you, what's the best way to do that? Uh, well, they can send me a, a, an email at, at johnburford at gmail.com. Um, I do have a website, cyrific.com.au, that's you know, S-C-I-R-I-F-F-I-C.com.au. And you can also email me through, through, through there, but uh, the best way is, is my Gmail account, just my name, one word. Give Cyrific a decent plug. <laughs> yeah, well, well, Cyrific, yeah, just um, to wrap up there, I started Cyrific about, I think, six years ago when I thought this is, this is the area I want to specialize in. And so I, I, um, it's basically doing science and robotics 
workshops and and I also uh, train teachers. It's like a it's a website that gives information about how I can um, support teachers in their learning around, particularly around robotics technology. Uh, and and also I run workshops for students um, mainly during the holidays and. And there's examples there in my, in my gallery about some workshops that we've done for primary schools and high schools. And so, uh, so yeah, so that's, a, that's a, a business I have on the side. I, I'm employed right now as a STEM teacher across four different primary schools, three of which are in the Catholic system and one is in the, uh, with the Department of Education. And so I'm a STEM teacher two days a week at a public school in Cameroon. And a one day a week STEM teacher at a Catholic school in Belfield, another one day a week STEM teacher at a Catholic school in Austral, and a one day fortnight at a Catholic school in Cabramatta. So I'm employed four and a half days a week uh, in STEM capacity across four schools. And so there's a little time for me to do a lot of scientific stuff, but there is that one, one day a fortnight where I, I do uh, the odd job with um, schools directly in in teacher training or in student workshops. And that's, that's terrific. <laughs> terrific. Awesome. Thanks for joining us, John. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me on, on board. And it was always nice to tell my story. All right. We'll talk some more very soon. <laughs> okay. That's all for this episode. If you have any questions or suggestions, please send them to our email address, questions at stemiverse.com, and we'd be happy to answer them. Do you want us to interview someone in particular? Let us know. Visit us at stemiverse.com to get the show notes of every episode. And subscribe on iTunes by searching for the name of our podcast, Stemiverse. That is S-T-E-M-I-V-E-R-S-E. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next time.